What's up, guys? Welcome back to the dumpster with another dumpster talk. We're with our friends here from Mantech. Uh, we listened in on one of their presentations at the roundtable event at Lancaster Chamber, and we knew we needed to have them in the dumpster. Yep. So yeah, like Todd said, um, we knew we had to have you guys here. We went to the it was the manufacturing roundtable with the chamber, so we thought it makes perfect sense. Um, Todd, if you want to tell, kind of talk about what they talked about in the meeting and. Yep. So a big, a good portion of their um, presentation was about engagement in the workforce and team building in fields that you might not think um, would, team building would be stressed in. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get on to the culture and everything as we go. Um, if we could cool. get a little intro of you guys, kind of your names and what you do at Nantech. Cool. All right. Good. We'll go around this way. Go ahead, Kent. You can All start right. it off. My name's Kent Keller. I'm an advisor for Nantech. I've been an advisor at Mantech for 15 years. Um, my background before joining Mantech, I was a uh, human resources professional. So I was the HR manager for uh, several smaller companies. Um, the largest employer had about 500 employees. So, um, all right. Uh, Bruce Newell, I'm the president and CEO of Mantech. I've only been on board, I just had my two year anniversary this week, as a matter of fact, Congrats. December 1st, 2020. Congrats. So two years in, on the job, that makes me a veteran at this point. I can no longer claim I don't know what I'm doing. Um, that's that's put me, that's given me some cover for a couple of years. I have about 30 years in manufacturing, um, machine shops and contract manufacturers. I've started, um, started and sold off three separate companies over the past 30 years. And a couple of years ago, I was looking for something new and Mantech popped up and it's been uh, best. I've had a lot of good jobs and this has been the best one I've ever had. So that's, that's awesome. awesome. Did yeah. you guys um, always know you wanted to like help people out in a way for a living? Does that make sense? I kind of knew I always wanted to make things. In fact, uh, my, I actually have a, a degree in accounting and finance. And after about a year and a half doing accounting and finance, I missed making stuff because I grew up in a machine shop. Yeah. And so I, I left that field to get back into manufacturing. So, and look, manufacturing helps every, everything we do every day that helps make our lives better. Someone manufactured it, whether it's this microphone, this table, this dumpster, the clothes we're wearing, you know, you name it, someone manufactured it. So I, I never thought about it directly in helping people, but absolutely. That's um, awesome. I wanted to be an MBA superstar, <laughs> but my... My vertical leap is not quite as good as some other people. Right. So <laughs> that's the same thing. So same I decided, thing. yeah, I decided to go to college for business, and um, I graduated with a business degree, and I went to work in the field of human resources, and um, I just it was one manufacturer after another, and um, that made a good sense that you know, 15 years in my career, I then joined Mantech for the last 15 years of my career here, and. Um, yeah, we really do help a lot of companies and it's all about, you know, being a resource for manufacturers. That's awesome. That's awesome. You, you mentioned that um, you like building stuff. Um, I heard on the podcast that that was one of your favorite things growing up. What was your favorite type of thing to build? Oh, Legos, man. Legos? Yeah. yeah. You give, me a, Legos. give me a pile of Legos and I'll yeah. put something together. Was there any specific like set? So I, I got into, yeah, I don't remember what age, but I got into like those expert builder sets. I remember like having a like a, a bucket high lift that had the, the moving bucket that tipped and, mm. and dunked. And then I also remember a, a tractor that had like a plow behind it moving that was built out of Lego. So I did um, models, but yeah, Legos jumped out of me yeah, first yeah. off. Things I like all the, all the big Star Wars ones. When yeah, I was yeah, yeah. Yeah, those were cool. Just didn't like stepping on them. Yeah, that tells you how long Star Wars has been around because I had Star Wars yeah, Legos yeah. when I was younger too. Yeah. 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 So I had some of those back. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So another one of the biggest things you guys talked about when we went to the roundtable, um, you guys talked about just kind of like creating employee engagement and kind of just like that's one thing we could all definitely talk about. Like it kind of like that's why we have this podcast here. Um, like Dan and Mike try to look at different roles that we could fill into. And it just kind of makes like I think we could all say it kind of makes work like you come to work and something that you want to do and actually see it happen in the company, it's pretty cool. So how important would you say that that type of stuff is? I think culture trumps strategy every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Yeah. It doesn't matter how well you plan and what kind of a strategy you have. It takes the people around you to execute that. Yeah. And it, 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 you know, we've seen since the pandemic, you know, 2020 was, you know, a, a, a year that can go in a dumpster as far as I'm <laughs> concerned, but yeah. 
it was one that many companies found that they uh, their culture persevered and got them through that much better than if they didn't have a good culture. Yeah. It was the people who did Herculean things. They did things that were, you know, that they normally didn't do to help their business survive. And um, it's what a good culture will do. Other companies will just say, that's not my job. That's your job. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. walking out the door yeah. now. And that's one big thing that Michael and Dan stressed to us that it's all about the people. Like, uh, Dan explained to me the one day, like he'll hire, um, people here off of their people skills over what they can do. Cause you can teach anyone to do this stuff, but if they don't have yeah. the people skills to kind of fit into the culture, it's kind of just not a good fit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Speaking about the culture, like that, when it comes to your younger kids and the, the next, I guess generation in like manufacturing especially. How do you guys go about like building that or starting something like that? So, and Ken can jump in here. I think it's an area that manufacturers have some work to do. Um, it's it's we have an aging workforce overall, and I don't know if manufacturing is more skewed or not. I would I would guess that it is, um, and so there's work to be done there. Um, I would say. As a manufacturer, first of all, get out and talk to kids. And I would send you guys out instead of me, right? Because who does a high school or middle school kid relate to more? Definitely you all. And uh, I think doing that's a good thing. But I think they've got, they got to start offering, you know, more than just a job. You know, it's it's a career path. It's an opportunity. It's varied. It's It's safe. It's... Um, it, but it's got to be more than just a job. Yeah. And I, so I think manufacturers have some work to do there, but many of them are doing it. Many of them are getting better. Um, I think getting exposure, you know, one thing that to me is interesting about manufacturing is it's kind of everywhere, but hard to explain from the standpoint of, again, everything we're interfacing with right now was manufactured. So it's everything, but it's not as like you, you can't point to one specific thing that charges people up necessarily mm-hmm. that gets them thinking about manufacturing. Like yeah. tech, pick up an iPhone and people see tech and they un- and they understand it, right? Yeah. And there's other things, maybe different areas. You look at a hospital, you understand healthcare in and of itself. Whereas manufacturers, kind of everything. From what I've seen from the millennial generation younger, um, they really kind of why they're doing things is as important as what they're doing. Um, and I think manufacturers can continue to get better of why they're doing something, why they're making. Every day you can go home and tell your family how you made people's lives better by making a better chair, a better microphone, a better piece of paper, a better glove, a better hat, you know, a better dumpster. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it's a, it's an area of, it's got to be a relentless, intentional pursuit yeah. of the next generation and why it's a good place for them to be and how they can help better the world doing it. Yeah. Off that point, I think, like, it definitely makes sense. Like, we, we talked a little before the show, so you guys kind of know. We all, like, knew each other before we started working here. So it kind of, it gave us kind of a reason, like, why we want to come here and make things different because we're yeah. like, have all of our friends beside each other so that's that definitely helps and then also like like off the other thing you said dan and michael really tried to like in the past two years really ramped up showing us like why we're torching the metal or like why we're why we're doing each job so it kind of gives you a gives you a good idea and kind of makes you feel better about like sorting this metal in the rain all day or whatever you have to do yeah, yeah. so also, when something leaves you where's it go well we have like so a bunch of different buyers so like there's steel mills Okay. Then there's like, a, well, the guy that you just talked to, Eric, he buys some aluminum from us. So that goes to all the way to Tennessee. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different. It's going back into products that we're all using yeah. somewhere, yeah. right? It's yeah. recycled. Yeah. Also, I think Mason could definitely talk on the point of, like, you just came from a bigger company. Oh, yeah. So you definitely, I mean, you're probably thinking a lot nowadays of how important culture is at wherever you're working. Culture was bad where I left. <laughs> you come here and it's completely... Culture here is really everybody gets along. It's not going after everybody. It's it's awesome. So that kind of like like the last job you had wasn't really in manufacturing and like no not not like hands on with manufacturing. So it kind of makes you with a good culture. It probably makes you like more comfortable coming into it. Yeah, yeah. Very good. I like cool. the point like that you it. made that um like to show people that it's not just a job but it's like a career. Like here they show us like areas where we can grow. I think that's big, especially for the younger generation. Like, um, I would never think that I was working at a scrapyard, um, but like the opportunities that we have are just amazing. 
So it's just, I feel like getting it in front of, I don't know how to put it, but just getting it in front of kids' eyes more. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know about any of this stuff going through school at all. Like, I was just always told, like, from all of my teachers, just, like, go to school, go to school, go to school. Yep. But, like, the stuff that they're teaching us here just goes so much farther than school. Like, we learn every day. We're always learning, so. Yeah, Yeah, up until 2020, manufacturers typically look for experienced people. And... You know, that means they didn't look to the younger generation um, for as, uh, you know, as, as good employees. And now with workforce shortages and other supply chain issues, they figured out that, you know, that, you know, the younger generation can add value to their to their workforce. And they're bringing them in and they're finding ways to uh, motivate them and, and, and get them to share some of the tribal knowledge from the older generation. So... And there is a massive knowledge transfer that needs to take place. And if uh, any business, whether it's manufacturing or something else, but I would particularly say manufacturing, mm-hmm. if you don't harness that those those uh, long-term employees' knowledge and get it passed down, yeah. it, it will become very hard to replicate yeah. down the road. So that definitely that's something I think a lot about. Like think about a lot when I'm here because like in the back of the yard, like all the big equipment that's running and stuff, and like. It's like a good portion of what we have to do in the yard. It's all ran by the guys that have been here for many years. So we've yeah, been here for a while. Yeah, 22, <laughs> 22 years, I think. Yeah, wow. they're all such a bit, such a big help too. So it, it would be kind of weird to, yeah, to not gonna, have them here. We're gonna have to learn, pick up some of these different skills. That's true. That, that kind of goes with. Um, so we talked to Jake Hall. He calls himself the manufacturing millennial. He's yep. like on LinkedIn and different stuff. Um, he had this, this like. Um, just a statistic on his LinkedIn that was like, I think it was 26% of manufacturing workers right now are over the age of 50. And I think like 14 years ago, it was like 11 or 12%. So definitely it shows that like a lot of the people working are older. Right. So we got to get the new, yes, got to get our generation in there. And there's, a, and there's a massive amount of opportunity for younger generation in manufacturing, whether they have college degrees or just skills. Yeah. Or just the desire to learn skills. If you know, they, I mean, obviously, a business would love to have a certified welder come in. A machine shop would love to see a certified welder come in. Yeah. But if you've got the right attitude, the right outlook, and the willingness to learn, there's going to be opportunities as well. Yeah. And there's also engineering jobs and draftsman jobs, and there's all kind of career paths from STEM to trades to just being a kind of a a young person that's got some ingenuity and ethic um, to get things done and learn and expand and grow. Going around um, traveling, I noticed that a lot of companies are even kind of having like their own school in a way, Mm -hmm. like taking workers on and taking time and even paying them to learn the skill for them to work. Um, I just think that's awesome. It's it's an awesome opportunity. I mean, one of the things we do at Mantech is we have a lot of training um, programs that we work with manufacturers. And we, I would say we've seen an increase in that demand, um, and both in quant- number of companies and number of employees that companies are willing to invest in to get them upskill, you know, yeah. get them project management class, get them a leadership training class. So, yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing, I think we're turning a corner on investing yeah. back in our people That's to make them better. Say. Definitely is a, like it's an investment. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, because we were just at Kinsley Steel and they had like a whole warehouse that was set up just for an apprenticeship. Yeah, yeah that's- and then they were saying too, like, all their experience, like they're looking for experienced welders, you can't find it anymore. And right. Yeah. That's why they're bringing in the big warehouse to, to these kinds of people. Yeah. It's awesome. To kind of go off of that, like, so when you guys go into the business, go into a business to help their team culture, what's like the first step steps you guys kind of take in that process? I'm going to kick that one to Ken. <laughs> this, is, this is what he does day to day. So, well, you first want to understand what the current culture is. And sometimes you do that through in certain surveys or talking, interviewing certain individuals to understand what their culture is. And culture is made up of, you know, the, the beliefs, the values, the internal happenings day to day, what's going on. Um, so you kind of you have to get a current state and then you have to sit with their management team and figure out what the future state needs to look like. What do we want the culture to be? If it's not what we want it to be right now, what do we want it to get to be? And then how do we get it there? And, and that's different for every employer. Yeah. But first identifying what the current culture is. What's the biggest problem you're finding when you go into businesses? Management doesn't listen to employees. 
they don't value their input. They don't they don't take their ideas and and uh, implement them. They discount them. They do it my way. I'm the boss. You know, yeah. this is my business. I've been here long enough that you know you do it my way. Yeah, yeah. I think we all can attest to that. We all work at jobs. I think that we're kind of just like a number and um, <laughs> like say there would be a complaint. No one really listens. Um, here, there's. I feel like there's really no complaints at first, but. Uh, it's like it's not like our boss is not here or anything like our like the owners are right next to us sorting mm -hmm. through the metal so it's just like a huge difference for us that's a big difference yeah a lot of companies that you know we go into it's the management isn't engaged with the workforce at all yeah and that, that's definitely a huge problem for sure yeah i think dan and michael really like over the past year and a half like really carved out time to think about like core values in the company and stuff and it really like like just like Todd said like if someone comes to work with an issue like we try to not let someone go home like in a worse in a worse mindset than they were coming in like that's just one of the core values that they just added um okay so yeah kind of definitely, definitely helps definitely a lot sense, yeah. I know last summer we kind of um not bump heads but there's a couple of situations but we none of us ever left like upset with each other Michael's really good with that. He kind of sets us, like, whether we want to or not, we kind of just sit down. And whether it's two hours, um, we just kind of just talk as long as it takes to just get through it. Because uh, no, no situation is big enough to just, like, we're so close here. No situation's um important enough to play. It's just not what we do here. Yeah. Hmm. That's, yeah. that's pretty active engagement, you know, to have that kind of conflict resolution and keeping the team together. So that's, yeah, yeah it's awesome here. Sure. I get, well, we only... And also just because we have, like, we only have 16 people here if everyone's here. So we got to really stay close, stay close niche and stay close together. I think it's good. Yeah. I don't know. We also, I don't know if you guys have any questions of, like, um, on, like, robotics or, like, yeah, we talked about in, uh, automation. Do you guys use any automation? Or, and or have you seen, like, an impact to, you know, manufacturing industry? So we're more on the consulting side of it. So man tech itself. Well, yeah, no, we use automation. It's more on an IT side of things than opposed to a manufacturing. But yeah, we absolutely use automation. And we're looking to continue to try to gain efficiencies through our systems and automation as well. We certainly see our, our clients using it. Um, different levels of success and investment. Um, I think... Uh, South Central PA, I can tell you, is slower to adopt automation in the manufacturing sector than other areas. Um, so I'd like to see it accelerate. Um, that's kind of one of the things I, I would put out there. You know, you're competing on a worldwide basis, whether you're 16 person scrapyard, machine shop, or Harley Davidson. Right? Yeah. You're competing worldwide, even though you may not feel it every day. And so you, you need to be constantly pushing the envelope. I don't think automation is a solution to workforce. You're going to need different types of people. So you may replace some lower level skilled jobs. But now, you know, if it's automated, it means it has parts. It turns on. It's got programming. It runs. Now you need technicians. Now you need programmers. Now you need uh, a higher level skill. So I don't think it's a, well, I can't get people all automate. Um, I think it's, well, I need better people and I'm going to automate because it just makes me a better, more efficient company. Yeah. So we see it and we'd like to see more of it. Yeah. I think like in that podcast that we had with Jake, he was saying like, I think it was 3 million industrial robots were installed like globally. So that's definitely, that's impressive. Yeah. For sure. it's I'd love to see the breakdown of sector. Yeah. Like how many of those are in automotive, yeah. um, you know, like are they dominating in a couple of areas that uh, I'd love, I'd love to see. Have you heard anything of like, 3D printing of metal at all. Like we went to a foundry um, that we're close with and they use like, they're trying to develop this like dust kind of thing that they can, they can use that pretty much as the 3D printing material and 3D print like metal parts, which that would take away scrap. So it's Have kind you, of- I mean, I know it's out there and I know it's early stages as far as that. I mean, I first saw 3D- expensive. Right. I mean, I first saw 3D powder metal printing about 25 years ago, Wow. but it was, one company that was really experimental yeah. um, and it really hasn't taken off. It's expensive. So I, I'm not sure. I mean, I know we see more and more 3D printing um, of more resins and, and things of that nature than we do metal. Uh, so I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I can't predict the frontier of that technology. You might see it more, Kent. I've never seen it. I 
lots of companies have asked me if I know of anyone who has one yeah. so they can get some, you know, usable prototypes instead of just resin and then turn it into, you know, machine and, and ingot um, to turn it into metal. But um, um, yeah, that's expensive technology and yeah, it, it's heard. coming down in price over time, but it just, it takes time. Yeah, that's what we've heard. It's like kind of, no one's really got it perfect yet, but it's kind of just like something to think about. Yeah. yeah. So automation, uh, automation is like everything else. It was very expensive when it first came out. And yeah. as the years tick by, as we have more birthdays, it gets cheaper and cheaper. And that's why you're seeing more companies dabble with it and experiment with it and, and reach out to companies like Mantec to ask for resources. Hey, I think I'm, I think this can be automated. You know, here's a process that I, I do with some regularity, you know, can you help me automate this? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. What are you guys um, thinking about? Like, what do you think manufacturing is going to look like for the new year? We know that 2023 is coming around. And earlier we looked with Dan at the ISM report and it contract it contracted for the first time since pre pandemic. So um, just want to see your thoughts on that. I think manufacturing and Ken, I'm going to ask you to jump in here, too. <laughs> but I think it might be a more lagging indicator than past um, if we're going a new recession. And depending on what your definition of that is, uh, will dictate whether you think we're in one or maybe in one. Manufacturing, usually you see durable goods drop first. You see those large machine orders drop off first. Clients we've seen and I've talked to, their backlog is pretty deep because of the supply chain issues. So I think it may be a little more of a lagging indicator before we see a large contraction. So I, I'm not sure what the telltale signs will be. I haven't heard yet many of our clients say they're in a slowdown. Um, what have you seen out there, Ken? Well, like you, my crystal ball is in the shop, so I can't predict, yeah. you know, too much into the future, you know, but um, yeah, sales are still very strong for most of our manufacturing clients, especially those in food service, food processing. Um, they just seem to grow and grow and grow with no, you know, stoppage. Machine shops and printing a little bit, you know, more problematic based on supply chain, based on commodities, um, influenced by events going on with Ukraine and Russia and, you know, the Chinese economy. And yeah, yes. so. it's crazy to think about that stuff. Like a month ago, we were looking at like the Chinese yuan. Their currency, like seven of their, their dollars equaled one of ours at, at the time. And that's just like mm -hmm. crazy to think about. Yeah. 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 It's definitely interesting. Do you guys think like um, like when as China come, like comes out of their zero COVID, like do you think, um, which I guess we don't really know when it will be, but do you think that will be like, you'll see big jumps up in the manufacturing or you don't really, it's hard to tell, I guess. Yeah, again. Kent, my crystal balls with Kent's because yeah. <laughs> if we had it, we probably would yeah. both already be retired and sitting on a beach somewhere. Um, I mean, look, China has their own demographic issues they're going to be dealing with over the next 20, 30 years as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure I would look to them as the barometer of where things are. I mean, I, yeah. I just read recently Apple's accelerating um, a pullout of a lot of their operations there and moving yeah. to other areas. The so, strikes, I think. right. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not sure as they come. I mean, as they come out of zero COVID, it may help the supply chain yeah. issues. Um, so from that standpoint, that may be a good thing. But I'm not sure they're, bar they're the worldwide barometer. Yeah, or we not. just keep a, keep an eye like on China because a lot of the metal is exported. So kind of we can make different like make money on different moves or whatever, or like the price of that kind of affects us. My hope is that manufacturing doesn't run back overseas to Asia to set back, set up manufacturing over there and then import it back over here for, you know, cheaper. Uh, che we hope that they reshore and when they stay here. So yeah, yeah. We're in a great area for manufacturing. I heard on that podcast that you're on, um, she explained York PA is like the epicenter of all good things pretty much. If it's made, it's made here. Yep. Um, and so nationwide, York County, and I would say Lancaster County as well, very similar about twice the amount of the population as a percentage is in the uh, manufacturing sector than on a nationwide basis. Wow. Um, so yeah, it, it is definitely an area 
where a lot of things get made across a lot of industries. It's a very diverse sector. And it's crazy. Like, I feel like we didn't, like, in school, we didn't really talk about manufacturing nope. that much that I remember. But we're in, like, the epicenter of it, so it's just it's just kind of funny. That could be a whole other podcast. I don't want to get into too, <laughs> too much trouble, especially since I have family members that are educators. But, you know, that, they're not really tasked with yeah. explaining this, yeah. right? So it's really going to be up to us. Maybe we'll need a dumpster it. part two. So. <laughs> <There we> go. <laughs> I don't know. Do you guys have any have any any more questions for um, them? Or? I had one about just about the yard of fun one. What was your guys? We took them on a little tour around the yard before uh, the podcast. What was your guys' favorite part, or what did you guys think was just like cool or interesting? I thought the coolest thing was the resale part. I had no idea you would filter out and pull out the resellable stuff, mm-hmm. and you've turned someone else's trash into an income opportunity for your business. Yep. That's awesome. And Dan and Mike ought to be proud of what you guys have done there. It is definitely, it is definitely a really good idea by the guys in the back. They're the yep. ones who, they sort the loads and stuff all the time. And especially like using their cranes, that's the only way they can get that big stuff out of there. So they kind of. I know Merv's always putting stuff aside and it's good for customers coming in. Cause like there's a guy who got something for his car. Uh, he bought it here for, he got it for like a third of the price he would online, which is just insane to me. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, you have um, another one of uh, Dan's family members, you know, putting that stuff on the uh, marketplace, marketplace. on the marketplace, you know, finding a a customer for it. I mean, you could, you know, standardize that. You could, you know, supersize that and you could, it could be a good income revenue for the, for the business sure. yeah that was some, that's that. some outside the box thinking and that that struck me as well um i mentioned to dan this may be the most organized scrapyard i've ever been in and i've been in a few so i mean is is you know you put everything in its context but it's, this place is obviously organized thoughtful like you can see that it's a business that someone cares about and not just dumping ground for things and and there's nothing haphazard about it so uh, and I would echo Kent's uh, comment, like, yeah, when I see someone else's garbage turn into an income stream, that's 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 cool. outside the box. Yeah. yeah. And I want Maine, you know, and oh, it's yeah. not quite automation, but, you know, the Internet's allowed for different sales channels. You yeah, get yeah. Someone coming in from Maine to buy. It's awesome. Quote unquote scrap, which yeah. obviously is not scrap for them. It's really cool. Yeah. You guys so have any um, any advice for us kind of furthering our we're all in our 20s? Isaiah is still 19, so whoa, we're kind of we're younger <laughs> guys. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Christmas baby, yeah, Christmas keep learning, keep, keep learning, learning. Right. right? Yeah, keep learning, keep keep filling up your toolbox with skills. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There is no skill that isn't worth knowing a little bit of something about. So, I, yeah, that would be my number one thing. And get out, and if you think this is a place where you'd like to see more 20 year olds. Tell Dan to get you out to a career day at a school or, or uh, get involved. And, We've definitely you know, been go, talking about that. Yeah. yeah. Go, go talk to kids. They'll, they'll listen to you. Yeah. They're going to listen to you more than the old guys here, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yep. And I was talking with you all earlier. You're smiling while you're working, so yep. you obviously still love it. So when you're doing something you love, it's not a job. It's not work. So... Yeah, well, I don't think any of us really come here and think we're working. Like, I still can't believe I get paid to work with my best <laughs> friends every day. Like, it's just, it's crazy. It's a blessing. That should be on your uh, recruiting pitch, right? That, yep. that video right there. And right? oh, I can't yeah. believe I get paid to work with my friends. Yeah, that's a big culture statement right there. Yeah. You yes, want to talk about, you know, driving applicants to the front door? Yep. You'll be turning them away. Sir. Yeah, you're competing, right? You're competing for labor, just like you compete for customers. Um, so you got to have something that's different, and it's not just going to be wages, because there's always someone willing to pay a quarter more. Um, what's your line? People don't leave. They, people don't leave uh, jobs for money. They leave for managers, right? They, you know, yep. culture, who they're working with, who they're working for, will dictate the talent level you bring in. So yeah, never stop learning. Keep going, and go tell others about it. Awesome. Get them here and get them into the sector. Yeah, well, thank you guys for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank for you. Having we appreciate us. it. Hey, awesome. for me, anytime I get out of the office, Kent gets to be in these places every day. <laughs> yeah. For me, I appreciate you having us out here. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
We're asked all the time the differences between a scrapyard and a junkyard. Oh, God. That is an old school it's thing, an guys. in-depth in question. Very in-depth question. Um, and I'm really not as qualified as most to answer this, but I'll give it a shot. Um, this is a third generation family business. We started out with antiques, um, gravitated to scrap, did cars, had loads of tires. My dad told you about how we could never get rid of tires. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a couple terms. So salvage yard became the term for kind of like cars, salvaging autos and things like that, wrecking yard. People can hear wrecking yard, salvage yard. Um, Junkyard became the terminology. So my grandma, who lives right over there, would always call it, get out of that junkyard. Everyone would say junkyard all the time. <laughs> we call it junkyard probably even still, like our that's family. What, that's yeah. what, whenever I heard of like Uncle Mike going to work when I was younger, he was always going to work at the junkyard. What did you think of that? Like well, what, what did kinda, that mean to you mentally? It kind of is like a... Got, really sadly it's just somewhere I didn't want to really be to be honest cause oh, just, and just it showed come, when you started yeah he just actually. comes home like come home dirty and just okay, like okay well look like you just been in the mud all day really mm -hmm. well that still happens but yeah. no matter what we call it we will be dirty and we're going to be yeah. proud of that dirt but it's just a different understanding um, of like what the junk is really correct yeah. correct so yeah so right now I mean scrap metal yard salvage yard uh, recycling yard that's kind of what we call it now, but it's, it's a junkyard. So I think it really doesn't matter as much what we call it. The one, the, the part where it matters is we fit, as you guys know, into the sustainability part of manufacturing. And we're so industrial. I mean, you were just at a couple of counts today, correct? Oh yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're out um, emptying containers from customers all the time. So we really are an industrial recycling yard to be honest that takes things from the public and accepts them and recycles so we are a recycling center but we also um if you want to call us junkyard we're good with that aren't we yeah are we tough enough yeah. for a junkyard todd yep you think so always okay always Some junkyard dogs all, all right junkyard, junkyard dog dogs. i know we don't we don't have any of them and we have cameras now that's like that's not that exciting but they don't eat, they don't cause us lawsuits, so so it's kind of okay, you know? I think yeah. we might need one again soon, but oh, okay. We'll uh, talk if about you it. want to bring Madison in, you can do that during the day. Oh, uh, um, so sum it up, guys. We we can always kind of go into tangents. But um, junkyard traditionally takes cars, more old school mentality, um, not organized, piles everywhere. Scrap metal recycling center, which is what we are very organized, industrial focused, accepts from the public and just recycles metals um, and part of the supply chain. So that's the difference. Yeah. yeah. Sound good? Yes, sir. All right, let's do it. I think it makes sense. That's a wrap, guys. guys. Yeah. Have a great Thanks, day. Guys.